Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus called the crowd to him and said to them, Listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if one blind person guides another, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, explain this parable to us. Then he said, are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles. For out of the heart come evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David, my daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Children and dogs. That's what jumps out from this text from Matthew's Gospel. And here, the term dog is not one of endearment, evocative of the way some of us think of our furry friends. No, here it is used to draw a great contrast between beloved children who belong and uninvited, unwelcome dogs. Insiders and outsiders. People with whom we feel an affinity and those toward whom we feel nothing or worse. Children are our flesh and blood, those we care about deeply, who have a claim on our affection. Dogs are those mangy interlopers we chase away whenever they try to take what rightly belongs, we think, to the children. But there's a real problem, many real problems, when we divide people up accordingly, valuing some and not valuing even being antagonistic to others. Of course, we see this happening all the time. We hear it from political as well as religious leaders, from our neighbors and co-workers. We see it happening in our communities, maybe within our own families. And it's reflected in our own deep-seated beliefs and prejudices. Some are children, others are dogs. We sort people into one category or another on the basis of race, ethnicity, nationality, religion, political party, ideology, economic status, gender identity, sexual orientation, immigration status, what neighborhood they live in, what school district they participate in, and on and on. We're essentially a tribal people. On one hand, the world gets smaller every day. On the other, we seem to get smaller too. And the issues we should have been able to overcome long ago continue to plague us. Because we haven't figured out how to stop defining ourselves by our differences. We only identify with, only feel affinity for our groups and fail to see any commonality with any, and really any value in those who belong, we think, to other groups. And you know, it's been more pronounced, or at least more obvious, in our national politics and public conversations these last few years. And it's so disturbing and so destructive. On one hand, 
better that it's out in the open so we can deal with it. But we are so polarized, we don't seem to be able to talk with one another. We know how to yell and point fingers, but we've got to do a whole lot better than that if we're going to get anywhere. It was three years ago this week that white supremacists descended on Charlottesville, Virginia, waving Confederate and Nazi flags, brandishing weapons, and shouting demeaning and threatening words of hate. Brian McLaren, Christian pastor and author, was there and said that most of those involved in terms of the white supremacists were young white men in their 20s and 30s, many of them dressed in khakis and white shirts. They could have been on their way to work at an office somewhere. But somehow they had come to believe that people of color and Jews and Muslims and gay and trans people are all dogs that have to be driven away or put in their place, lest they take what they believe belongs only to straight white Christian America. How did they learn these things? How did they learn to hate? How will they unlearn to hate? How will any of us? For it's alive and well on the rooftops of Elizabethtown, in the streets of Portland, and in the attitudes and apathy of so many right here in Lancaster, and likely also in many of us buried in the unexamined attitudes and assumptions that we hold. The only way anything is going to change is if each one of us does the difficult but necessary work to gain an increased awareness of the prejudices that we ourselves harbor and the way those prejudices play out in our lives. It is important for us to do this work, and it's important that we do it now. Our society has to be repaired from the inside out. Conservative commentator David Brooks preached a sermon at the National Cathedral on Independence Day weekend this summer, and it was a good sermon, I thought. And if you missed it, of course, you can always Google it. In it, Brooks expressed the hope that the country is waking up in many ways, that many are coming to see things more clearly, maybe seeing them for the first time, including the racism that's baked into our society and its institutions. I would like to share in Brooks's hope. I would like to share in the hope that many people are finally seeing that the COVID-19 virus doesn't care what group you are in, even though there are groups disproportionately affected by it. That hate speech can't build anything but only tear things down. That an over-militarized police force is harmful, especially to those on whom force is more likely to be used. That equal access to health care and a quality education are human rights and not partisan issues that both of those are necessary for a healthy economy. That communities are strong, nations are strong, only when they take care of their weakest members. That we've got to start valuing what we have in common rather than accentuating and demonizing our differences. So that together we can start taking care of one another and this planet today, or none of this will matter at all tomorrow. Concerned with the tribalism that is all too rampant, I find this text from Matthew's Gospel to be particularly challenging. Because here it is Jesus himself who seems to refer to people in these same terms. He calls some children, others dogs. I mean, the rest of us are already doing too much of that, but it's difficult to hear and make sense of Jesus speaking such words. It happened when he encountered a Samaritan woman who asked Jesus to heal her daughter. Up to that point in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus was clearly the Jewish Messiah sent to redeem the Jewish people. But in the encounter we hear about today, the scope of his ministry was challenged and, I think, expanded. By the rules of the day, governing those who were considered to be children and dogs, the Canaanite woman had no business even talking to Jesus. She was a woman in a culture in which women had no power or position. And she was a Canaanite, a foreigner, a non-Jew with whom Jews did not associate. And yet she approached Jesus anyway. And when she did, she addressed him as the Jewish Messiah using the title Lord, Son of David. That must have gotten Jesus' attention. 
He was still waiting for his own people to recognize who he was. And here was this Canaanite woman correctly identifying him. Having gotten his attention, she appealed to him to heal her daughter, who she said was being tormented by a demon. But Jesus did not respond. There was no acknowledgement that she had correctly identified him, no words of sympathy regarding her daughter, no offer to help or heal, nothing. Jesus was silent. She continued on, apparently undeterred, intent on pleading her daughter's case. And so persistent was she, the disciples became annoyed and urged Jesus to send her away. Jesus seemed to be okay with that idea, saying, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, repeating words he had spoken back in Matthew chapter 10, confirming that his identity was as the Jewish Messiah. And this Canaanite woman and her concerns were outside of the scope of his ministry. But she wouldn't give up. Kneeling before him, she pleaded, Lord, help me. Jesus then engaged her directly for the first time, saying to her, it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. Ouch. It's tempting, of course, to try and explain it away by saying something like, Jesus didn't really mean what he was saying. He was just speaking aloud what he knew his disciples believed and doing so to set up a teaching moment with them. Maybe. And yet still he said it. Given that there have been so many times when religious people have said demeaning and exclusionary things that have been damaging and hurtful, it's especially difficult to hear such things coming from Jesus. What's going on? Could it be that Jesus' harsh tone is itself revealing? that this woman had touched a nerve somehow, that by her presence and by her request, this woman has challenged Jesus' own assumptions about himself and his ministry, and he was not at all certain how to respond. And having not yet worked it out internally, he does so externally, but it's messy to say the least. With the mother's persistence, the woman pushed back. Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And with that, she broke through. Whatever lack of clarity Jesus had was gone. Whatever hesitations he had were pushed aside by the compassion that welled up inside him. And he said, woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And Matthew tells us that her daughter was healed instantly. Maybe it took a flesh and blood person, a real human need for Jesus to respond to in order for him to realize that if his ministry was about grace, then there was no way to limit it, that there were no bounds to his love, that he had indeed come to bless the whole world, no exceptions. If so, this story In Matthew's Gospel is a conversion story. And it wasn't the Canaanite woman who was converted, it was Jesus, whose understanding of the scope of his ministry was expanded, enlarged, whose arms were pushed open wider to include in their embrace a Canaanite woman, and if her, then also so many others. This story may be disturbing, but it is also intriguing and full of hope because it shows a very human Jesus struggling in some of the ways we struggle and evolving in his understandings. How? The same way you and I change the way we see things and come to understand those we view as different from us by encountering a real person who has real needs and concerns the same as we do. If you're still bothered and confused by this passage, let me at least say this. We do know what Jesus did after this encounter with the Samaritan woman. 
In Matthew's Gospel, his arms open up wider and wider until finally we see him on the cross where his arms would be fully extended as he suffered and died for not just some, but for all. He lives to love us still. All of us. In his eyes, there are only children, precious children including you and me, including all of God's beloved children. Thanks be to God. Amen.